uh, I will I will now read out uh, some questions from the floor uh, from the audience. Um, uh, Mr. Stefan Schuster is asking, hello, thank you very much for the conference on the panel. Uh, one thing uh, already mentioned, um, which should also be discussed in research is the question, why do no do countries do this? There must be benefits for countries uh, by doing this race to the bottom, aren't they? Or do they just believe that uh, there are benefits uh, on such measures? And if there are any, does it pay off and, and for whom? I guess there have to be uh, a site single countries as well as in the EU as a whole. Is there any evidence on that? Uh, is, who in the panel would like to? Yeah, uh, I, there's only a, a, a few remarks because I come from a member state from Germany where we don't have these possibilities. Only for SMEs, we have some additional uh, um, possibilities of super deduction for research and development. Uh, so Germany is not a front runner in this. So um, because we are not convinced that that is really helpful. On the other hand, Germany is one of the member states who has the highest investments in research and development. And, and therefore, I, I don't see really the need for this uh, super deduction possibilities, what we have in some member states, and not blaming the state I'm at the moment. Uh, I'm in my office in, in Brussels, but I will not blame Belgium. But for example, uh, Belgium has a system in place, and, and Paul, we investigated that during our negotiations on the CCCTP, which was a good experience, as you see, <laughs> that uh, we cooperated so closely together on that. And we really saw that gives the wrong uh, incentives uh, to the industry. And, and I do not see that the researchers are moving from all over Europe to Belgium. I do not see that Belgium is now the front runner in research and, and development because of the super deductibility. And therefore I have no argument found uh, along the street um, uh, which gives any idea why this kind of, of super deduction and additional deduction possibilities really creates a benefit for a member state granting it. Um, yeah, maybe I, I can say a word so for, for an academic point of view. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of difficult to assess for a single country if a regime is beneficial or not that could be done uh, thanks to country uh, country studies but you have to assess for every economic benefits and downside from each regime uh, what what we could uh, say is that uh, basically some countries uh, think they can benefit from preferential regimes and some are probably benefiting from these regimes but it's not obvious and it's not always the case for instance uh, we can see that portugal that implemented the 0% regime on, uh, on pensions income for foreign pensioners, they, they, they went back to a 10% tax rate, uh, uh, I think it was two years ago, because uh, the consumption was not enough thanks to the 0% tax rate. So it's not obvious that they are beneficial and at, uh, at an aggregate level, we could see it's a, it's a loss. I think when we talk about um, corporate tax incentives and especially competition over investment by multinational enterprises, we can have uh, beneficial effects for individual countries that um, try to uh, attract or that manage to attract multinational activity because it creates, of course, a limited amount of jobs. It, it creates some um, economic activity. Um, if really real real economic activity is also relocated, okay? So we assume that if real economic activity is relocated, it creates some benefits for the economy that attracts those m &Es. But at the same time, another country loses, okay? And that's the general dynamic of globalization, which is reinforced, I think, in the European Union due to the common market that results in, okay, we have maybe some job gains, we have some investment gains in individual countries, we have losses in other countries, but we should not forget overall that the general effect is that corporations pay less and less tax in Europe, and that this um, only partially benefits individual governments and maybe the people that get jobs, but the biggest beneficiaries of those developments, I would say, are the shareholders of corporations. Okay, and this is sometimes 
uh, forgotten when we when we talk about all those benefits, the real economic effects that, that we try to obtain or that countries try to obtain is that it has major distributional consequences redistributing income um, uh, in between countries, but also in between different um, social layers. Okay, because as we all know, um, uh, corporate owner or ownership of, of, of stock options and in general shareholders of, of corporations are quite concentrated in the top of the income distribution. Thank you. Mr. Tang, yes. Uh, to, uh, to add to uh, Sarah, I think what we have seen with corporate tax system uh, is that we, uh, we've seen an increase in intangible assets, intellectual property, financing structures with interest and uh, dividends, uh, digital activities, um, which are hard to, uh, where it's hard to pinpoint a location. And that has been used by many corporates to use these assets to optimize their, uh, their tax structure, to, to optimize tax planning, um, putting a lot of pressure also on, uh, on many member states to reduce their, their marginal tax rates, knowing that there was a sort of arbitrage ongoing. So that's why we ended up in a, in a race to the, uh, to the bottom. Not even sure that member state, the countries expected a real gain from it to expect, for example, an increase in real activity, but they were almost forced to lower the, the corporate tax rate with this pressure of, uh, of, of, the, of the corporates. Um, more generally, what you see is I was what I find interesting in the report was also the personal income tax competition. I was not, I didn't have the overview that I have now reading the, the report. And while well, there are schemes, well, we just mentioned the Portuguese pensioner scheme. What, what is the benefit for that? Uh, even for Portugal, it's very limited. It, it's zero if you have a zero corp, if you have a zero rate. But it's very clear that there's no gain in activity. What, what is the, the gain overall? Uh, there's no increase in investments. It's just pensioners moving their location. That's all, uh, and it's very clearly to the detriment of uh, then of other countries that uh, that lose uh, lose tax revenue. So that's a very clear cut example where you see that is an, uh, a beggar thy neighbor policy, and this is exactly where Europe needs to step in to identify which uh, which are those beggar thy neighbor tax policy and make sure that we have guidelines, rules of the game that doesn't allow it. Um, Tax systems can be good to promote some of the uh, real economic activity, for example, uh, R&D, though I favor very much subsidies, uh, but it can promote uh, activity, but in this case, but most of the times, um, what we see is, uh, is a form of uh, beggar uh, neighbor policies. And that's why I say tax competition gives competition a real bad name. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we have a question from Sarah Paz, uh, from um, a reporter with Tax Notes, and it touches uh, again on the subject of the debt uh, to equity bias, but in a very, uh, very uh, precise manner. Uh, it says, dear Mr. Tang and Mr. Ferber, what is your opinion of the Commission's proposal for a debt equity bias reduction allowance contained in the Commission's communication on business taxation in May? How do you think this could resolve issues of debt equity bias? What might be some obstacles to its passage? A very, very precise question. Um, Mr. Felber, maybe? Yeah, as I said already, when you asked me the question, Jan, uh, I think the, the commission proposal goes in the right direction. It shows the path uh, to, the, to addressing the issue. I think it will not be the final step as uh, this bias will continue to exist, but will be will be reduced and of course uh, in, in the traditional uh, system of, of uh, tax laws where um, costs on the one hand uh, create the possibility of uh, deduction which you have of course with uh, the debt rates and the, uh, the interest rates uh, for the debt which you don't have uh, when you ask for equities you have only the costs for demanding equity um, you have to find a, a new approach on, on, on how to address that. Now, therefore, as I said, Commission goes in the right direction, will not be the final step, but it's a very important first step, as I said, in the right direction. So can I, can I uh, add to this? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Marcus. When Marcus and I were 
discussing this in 2016, I didn't think there was much support from, uh, from there were some member states supporting it, uh, but not that many. Uh, why I still think it's a good idea to, that the commission put it forward, it, because it puts the debt equity bias on the agenda. The, I guess, it, like we discussed, there are different ways of doing that. You can allow an uh, allowance for corporate equity, but you can also limit the interest reductions, but you have to put it on the agenda in the first place. And second, I think that debate ha may have changed since 2016. We see now more emphasis on resilience. I think equity is a good way to provide more resilience and make sure that um, the corporates are, uh, are not as fragile to the detriment also of the workers in, uh, in, uh, in difficult circumstances. So, uh, I, so it's a good way, it's a good step, it's a good step forward, uh, but I don't think it will easily come to a conclusion, uh, really, still. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question, uh, again, sort of circling back to what we've uh, discussed already in a way, but uh, it's, it's kind of quite, uh, quite straightforward, uh, namely, um, what are the chances, asks uh, Malta Vesar, uh, what are the chances, how probable is it that large multinational companies would leave the EU if tax incentives stop and that uh, and while others still uh, offer such tax incentives outside the EU? Can I jump into that? It's a sort of, it's the fallacy in this debate, right? So much of the, uh, of the investments that we see is on paper only. So what we do is eradicate uh, the phantom, uh, the phantom investment. I don't think that uh, real act, uh, economic activities are easily moved around, uh, easily cross borders. Uh, so yes, some foreign direct investment seems very mobile because it's just paperwork. But usually, uh, real foreign direct investment is not uh, that mobile. For example, you don't just move your headquarter or your marketing center or your distribution center across across Europe or outside Europe for that matter. And there are still very good reasons for corporates to be within the EU. We are the largest, um, largest market in the world. Where do you want to be? Well, within the borders of the European Union, I would say. So I'm not, I'm not at all worried about that. Um, uh, so. If I may add, uh, I fully share what Paul has said. Uh, the single market is a value by itself. 440 million people living in the European Union um, is something which you can't get somewhere else. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have still some advantages. But inside the single markets, of course, we saw movements of companies to put the seat somewhere where uh, tax possibilities are better than somewhere else. So that's why I said more than once now, uh, that are issues we have to address by ourselves, where OECD gives no answer, where we have to find a European approach uh, to address that. On the other hand, it's other issues which are important. If you look at now after <laughs> more or less two years of Corona, um, in the 80s, early 90s, Europe was the place to produce pharmaceuticals. It isn't anymore, is it? which has nothing to do with taxation which has a lot to do with other circumstances uh, Europe has not granted in comparison to, to, to other regions in the world. And therefore, um, tax is not uh, the first incentive to leave uh, something like European Union. It could be the last small stone above a lot of other things. And th that's why I mentioned pharmaceuticals, uh, especially production that left for other reasons than taxation laws. And therefore we have to be aware that uh, a single market is more than a tax area. It is, has to do whether uh, researchers are available, whether you can do some uh, uh, production with dangerous goods. Sorry, that is what when you speak about pharmaceuticals, for example, whether uh, the, the um, usage of pharmaceuticals is uh, properly designed, if I stick to that, but therefore, there are a lot of areas around which have to be taken into account. Tax will not be the uh, decision taker. It will be the last stone of a long process, maybe, but therefore I'm not so concerned. But that does not mean that we have to address our problems, which have been mentioned more than once now. 
Thank you very much. Uh, do, do our tax observatory experts agree with that as well, Stefano? Yeah. Yeah, I agree that there is not only one reason why firms are in the European Union. And of course, if tax incentives are important, I mean, if it's not the only reason why firms are present in the, uh, inside the EU borders. So I agree with the uh, we We have quite a few more questions in the, in the chat, but uh, time only for one more, I think. So uh, apologies to, to those who will not have their questions read out. Uh, we read the last one here. It's from uh, uh, Ms. Chiara Putaturo. The review of the mandate of the Code of Conduct Group has just been published and will be endorsed next week by the ECOFIN. There is no plan for the moment to expand the work on individual harmful tax regimes, something the EU Tax Observatory and the EP have asked for. Do you think uh, there is still space for it and is something uh, the Commission and Member States should pursue? That's a question from Chiara Pugatura from Oxfam. Can I sort of, yeah, I, I, if the report of uh, the EU Tax Observatory shows one thing, it's the development in the personal income tax schemes aimed at the high, high net worth individuals. It's growing, uh, it's very clearly um, a beggar thy neighbor policy. I mentioned the Portuguese uh, pension scheme. Uh, so there's every reason to look into that. And that also grows if more and more workers start to work digitally and can choose their tax residency for that matter. And I think tax residency should be an issue uh, within the European Parliament. I think the European Parliament can be one of the front runners in this area. Uh, and we need to address it, but I very much hope that the commission will address it. That we need to push the commission because I don't have high expectation on the, the code of conduct group. It's still very opaque. It's not particularly effective in uh, fighting uh, tax avoidance. Um, I would love to have to see the, the, the scope of the code of conduct group to be extended to personal income taxes to look into these, um, um, uh, let's say, aggressive tax schemes. Uh, but then again, I don't have high expectations. So we really need to put it on the agenda, but also bring the commission on board to look into this and to, to make to put pressure on um, to raise public awareness and to, make, to raise political pressure to uh, to stop these kinds of uh, back and neighbor policies. I can continue directly because it's really disappointing what is on the table. Yeah, we asked for more as European Parliament representing the citizens of Europe. Yeah, to be very clear what our aim is and our, our uh, duty. On the other hand, um, I think ECOFIN will uh, follow the advice and uh, will not change a word. But that means for us, uh, Paul, and we will have meeting this afternoon <laughs> again in the FISC committee, that we have to increase our pressure and uh, to increase uh, the civil society, the pressure coming from the civil society and, and, and from the citizens as a whole, which we are representing, that uh, we get a way of addressing this issue by those who are responsible. And you can't hide saying, oh, I'm not responsible, Europe has to, but on the other hand, as I said, tax issues, anonymous decisions, um, a lot of competences in the head of the mem uh, hands of the member states. So therefore, uh, no one can put the finger to someone else they all together have to find a solution. And that means for us continuing uh, the pressure uh, that we get more and more step by step. But for the moment, it's still disappointing that not everyone has understood uh, the demands uh, from the public. Sadly, sadly it is so. Um, thank you very much. Our, our time has uh, run out. So uh, uh, my uh, sincere thanks to all the panelists and uh, uh, thank you for uh, your your wisdom and uh, sharing it with us. I'll hand, hand over to Mr. Nikolaitis for uh, uh, final remarks. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all participants and uh, also to Jan for moderating this uh, um, very interesting discussion. I, I really enjoyed it and I think it was very, um, very interesting to hear for everyone, from everyone. Um, Extremely valuable as well to have the two uh, leading MEPs on uh, tax issues uh, with us today. 
Um, and I know it's a busy taxation day. It's a taxation super day in the afternoon with uh, Commissioner Gentiloni in the Parliament and the Peace Committee as well. So before closing, just to give everyone a quick uh, heads up of uh, our plan activities. Uh, on the research front, uh, we are planning for a new report to come out at the end of January, uh, which will focus on the uh, real estate in tax havens. So this will be uh, a new topic and also very interesting, I think, to uh, many of the uh, participants to, uh, to read about. Uh, we also have a, a, an event to complement that uh, report, uh, and you will know details uh, about that very soon. And uh, uh, we also have an interesting plenary session uh, that will happen during the World Inequality Conference at the Paris School of Economics at the, uh, on the 8th of uh, December, uh, so in a, a couple of days. Um, uh, and the topic of the discussion will be um, the 15% uh, global minimum tax. Uh, there is an array of uh, panelists, uh, David Robbery from the OECD, Lucas Chancel from the EU Tax Observatory and the World Inequality Lab. Uh, we will have another leading uh, taxation MEP, Van Giegel, uh, from, uh, from the Greens. Uh, we have Theresa Nee from the EU Tax Observatory and also Gadram Wolf, uh, the director of Bruegel. Uh, to discuss uh, the, the effects of the second pillar. Uh, all information of our current studies and the plan events can be found in our website, uh, taxobservatory.eu. And we also encourage you to follow us on social media and to subscribe in our newsletter to keep you up to date with the latest studies and events. And with this, uh, let me thank you, uh, thank you all and wish you uh, a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.